Let's bring Michael Kasky blomain into the conversation. We'll get his thoughts on the draft, the Sixers, NBA free agency. Uh, he covers the Sixers for 97.3 ESPN.com. He's an NBA writer uh, at 24-7 Sports. He's a uh, member of of the uh, Pro Hoops Writers, uh, Professional Basketball Writers Association, and, of course, uh, kind enough to join us right now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. So, MKB, give me uh, your give me your um, Zion Williamson comparison and overview of what kind of player you think he might be. You know, Mike, he reminds me right now a lot of uh, a young Blake Griffin coming to Oklahoma uh, his earlier years in the NBA with the Clippers where he was getting by, you know, a lot on, on sheer athleticism. He was, you know, Lob City throwing down a lot of dunks, getting out on, on the fast break and just, you know, out jumping and out, out athleticizing a lot of guys. Uh, but then ultimately, you know, you, you've seen Blake deal with injuries and kind of take a next step where he's developed, you know, a face-up game, a turnaround, even all the way out to the three-point shot. And ultimately, I think that's going to be, you know, make or break for Zion, whether or not he's going to be, you know, I think we all can agree he's going to be probably a good a good player. But I think the difference between good and great is if he's going to be able to kind of adapt that raw athleticism that he has to fit um, you know, what teams are looking for out of their big guys <clears throat> in the league today, which is, you know, pace and space. So I would say probably, you know, a young, a young Blake. Do you think, uh, let me say, do you think that he makes an instantaneous, like, impact, like right off the bat where he's an all-star as a rookie, like 20 points a game? Or, are, you know, because people are talking about, like, he's the most anticipated player since LeBron James and all this stuff. I, I I don't know. Maybe I'm just uh, I I'm a little skeptical that he's going to turn like a like the Pelicans around in one year. Yeah, well, there's a difference. I think he could definitely make an impact, especially you know considering the fact that they Anthony Davis has gone there now, which totally opens up you know the situation for it to be Zion's team. They're gonna you know go through him, and I think he will have the opportunity to to put up. You know, some big time numbers, twenty, ten, five, something like that as a rookie, which is LeBron like, but in terms of actually impacting winning, you know, you rarely see a rookie come in, even if they're putting up, you know, gaudy numbers. LeBron didn't make the playoffs the first few years in Cleveland. You don't usually see a player like turn a team around that quickly. So I don't think that he'll necessarily all of a sudden, you know, carry this Pelicans team to like the sixth spot in the West next season. But I do think that there's a chance for him to really, you know, put up some some crazy numbers as a rookie and then develop with the team and turn them into a, you know, a contender a few years down the road. Well, you know, Mike, it's been said and it's been written, and I'm not sure I disagree with it, that in the end, R.J. Barrett might be the better player out of that Duke trio and better than Zion. And, and certainly it's interesting that there was a report today that the Knicks turned down, I think, the offer from the Hawks to get, uh, what, two first-round picks for the for the 8 and 10 for the number 3 overall which means to me that they really like RJ Barrett and not only is it that maybe it's not so great from 4 and, and below but that they think he might be the best player in the entire draft yeah, that, I think that's legitimate, too. I mean, there was obviously a lot of hype about Barrett going into Duke last year, and obviously Zion kind of took over all the headlines and all the national stories. But, you know, Barrett has a game that, you know, projects to translate, you know, really smoothly, probably even more smoothly and cleanly, you know, directly to the league than Zion does because he has a, a position, you know, he, he's mm -hmm. a long wing player, six seven, uh, that can shoot, that you can, you know, basically say, all right, well, this guy projects right now as a perfect two or three, you know, put him out on the wing with the team and let him, you know, space the floor for you, which is exactly, you know, kind of the style of play that the league is going to right now. So Barry is a guy that you could really see right away where you're like, all right, this guy has a fit in the league, whereas I am, it's a little bit, you know, we were just kind of talking to be, you know, a blade a Charles Barkley, is he going to adapt well to the style of play that's in the league where he's not, you know, able to just rely really on his size and athleticism because there'll be guys that are, you know, just as big and athletic as him. So I think that, you know, obviously Zion's locked in at that top spot. We're not going to see Barrett jump him. But I think, especially in the short term, there's a chance that Barrett could be, you know, just as good as, as Zion these first couple of years if he's able to, you know, come in right away and start knocking down shots for whatever team drafts him for sure. MKB, Michael Kasky Blow Main. Follow him at the real Mike KB on Twitter, uh, where he tweets, There's a lot of interest in JJ Reddick around the league. Wouldn't be shocked if, uh, shocked if the Sixers weren't able to bring him back. He seems like a forgotten soul in free agency, but, you know, that's interesting. And a lot of people perceive Michael that, you know, he lives in Brooklyn 
and that that would be the spot he doesn't really – like it doesn't seem like he's the kind of guy who's going to uproot and go to Phoenix or uproot and go to Sacramento. So do the Sixers – you said there's a lot of interest out there, but is it coming mostly from Eastern Conference teams, and how legitimate is it that they just can't get J.J. to come back? Yeah, I think it's actually coming from all over, Mike. You're, I've, I've been hearing that, you know, obviously the Sixers have interest. There's, you know, reports that the Lakers have interest now, uh, you know, since acquiring Anthony Davis, getting, you know, shooters around LeBron and, and AD, JJ would be an obvious target. For the, you know, the Clippers potentially are, are another team that's been mentioned if they somehow, you know, Kawhi, if they're able to get him and they want some more guys to fill out the roster around him. Then there's teams in the East, the Nets, uh, the Pacers were a team that, that he considered signing with last year. There could still be some interest there. And I think, you know, it's a, obviously he's in Brooklyn, his family's in Brooklyn, but I don't think that precludes him potentially going somewhere else. It doesn't necessarily mean that he would have to uproot, you know, his entire family. Like he had a, he has a place in Philly and also a place in Brooklyn. And he could, you know, swing something similar if there was a situation that he really found attractive. He's obviously on the last legs of his career, so it's not like it would be this long-term thing. He's probably going to end up signing, you know, a one- or two-year deal wherever it is. And if he thinks it gives him a legitimate chance to, you know, win a championship, I think he said something similar when we talked to him at the exit interviews last month that, you know, of course, what his family, you know, the, his family is part of the equation, but it's certainly not the only thing that he's considering this summer. So I think the Sixers will certainly have competition. And, you know, Mike, like you said, he's kind of a forgotten guy when you're talking about James. Jimmy, Tobias, and, you know, after those guys are, you know, potentially signed or not, it's a question of if the Sixers are going to have the amount of money that, that J.J. could be looking for or if another team will come in and give him, you know, more money and a similar role that the Sixers could offer him. What's his future, Mike, if the Sixers run it back and they bring back Jimmy and bring back Tobias, and even if they're able and he wants to come back and they do it, I still feel like if the kid is ready, then – Zaire Smith has to probably be a starter, and you're better off having J.J. coming off the bench. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Jeff. I think that J.J.'s days as a starter, at least on a championship-caliber team, are behind him. I think if he were to come back – you know, in Philly, you would have to be in a reserve role. And that doesn't mean he's not going to play a big role. And it's not, it doesn't mean that, you know, sometimes at the end of games, he's not going to be out there. He's obviously a huge weapon mm -hmm. uh, for them, for them on the offensive end. But I think we all know, you know, the liability on the defensive end and just the, you know, kind of the one nature of it. You know, he's a floor spacer. He can't really create. He's not a guy that's going to put it on the, put the ball on the floor and take it to the rim uh, himself. I think the Sixers really benefit from a guy that could, you know, more of a two-way player and more of an all-around offensive player in that starting spot. Now, whether that would be Zaire after, a, you know, an off-season of improvement or if it's, a, you know, another guy from the outside that they bring in, like, you know, let's say Danny Green, something like that, this, you know, another free agent that's going to be out there. And then you bump J.J. to the bench. I think that'll help, you know, not only round out the this, this second unit but make the Sixers that much more formidable, especially defensively in that, in the, that first five. Hey, uh, what do you think is the ceiling of growth in terms of personnel this offseason? Is Jimmy and Tobias coming back the height of what they can achieve? Or do you think there is a bigger potential plan? Let's say they just don't bring one of those guys back or they don't bring both of them back. What is the, the height of what this offseason can look like? It's really tough, Mike, because, I mean, if you go down the list and let's say they don't bring those guys back, most of the other big names, you really don't – you don't hear the Sixers associated with them or, or mentioned. and you, I, you don't see a situation where, you know, Kevin Durant's not going to be signing here, Kawhi's not going to be coming here, Kyrie, you know, those guys aren't going to be coming here. Most of them will – you know, Clay Thompson will probably stay in Golden State. So if the Sixers end up losing out on either both or one or the other of Jimmy and Tobias, you're looking at a situation where they'll probably have to go out and sign, you know, a, a couple mid-level guys rather than another big-name player, which is, you know, a, a situation that they kind of painted themselves in last last year where Elton went all in on these guys that were on expiring contracts. Uh, you know, the Sixers only have four guys under contract for next season now, so uh, there's you know, there's, they're, they're limited in what they can do outside of those guys. They don't have max space unless it's for those two specifically so they can, you know, dip into the luxury tax to pay those guys. But if they, you know, if Jimmy stays and Tobias walks, they don't necessarily have a second max spot, uh, max spot to even tempt one of these top guys with. So I think the best case scenario really is that they're able to bring these both of those guys back. If not, 
the talent level uh, of that first five might end up having to take a, a step backwards. Well, let me pitch this to you, Mike, and you tell me if you, you like it or not. If they were to lose Jimmy Butler, and as you mentioned, not be able to get a Kemba, not be able to mention, get like a, a Kyrie Irving, if they put a lot of monies and pro- money and probably a max into Chris Middleton, who I believe is an unrestricted free agent, to they take, got a lot of them, by the way, the to Bucks. take Butler's spot. I thought he had a pretty good playoffs. I think he averaged 17 points in the playoffs. He averaged uh, over that in the regular season. Shot really well from three-point land during the postseason. I, I think he'd be not a name that everybody would fall in love with, but a pretty good alternative if you can't bring back Jimmy. Yeah, that, that's a, not a bad name. It's so, he's you know, somewhat similar role to what Tobias could play, and it is you know something that the Sixers would have to consider if they end up uh, losing one of those guys. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, the Sixers are going to go as far as Embiid and Simmons takes the, you know take them moving forward. So you know, as much as this summer is about the free agents for the Sixers, it's also about those two guys. Um, you know, obviously taking a, a big step forward, and as long as there's you know, they need talent around them. I'm not saying that they don't, but as long as there's competent pieces around them, it's ultimately going to be them that makes or breaks this team. A guy like Chris Middleton is a guy that could come in and plug in, uh, you know, pretty nicely into, you know, potentially either a three or four spot, probably a four spot with, with the Sixers off of Embiid and give him some space. So I think that's something you'll see, you know, if they do end up losing uh, either or those guys, you'll have, they'll have to start looking um, you know, like you said, not at the top tier like Kemba and Kyrie, but there's that middle level guys like like you just mentioned there, uh, Malcolm Brogdon, uh, Bogdan Bogdanovic, some of these other guys that aren't necessarily household names, but that could still be really solid fits for the Sixers. You got uh, real quick um, last off season, the free agency. It felt like you know people were making out like this is the most uh, important off season in their history. And, well, it would have been if they got LeBron. <laughs> and they didn't end up. It didn't end up going the way that many people were hopeful. They, you know, right. we're we're a star hunting, and they didn't get a guy. And then people thought they were a failure. And you had just tweeted out, Michael, that you thought that they ended up being the third best team uh, in the league. So is this off season? Does it feel like it has? the same importance that people thought last offseason did. Yeah, Mike, I think this offseason is huge, potentially even a little bit more importance than last offseason because I think last offseason, you know, going into this past season, even though, you know, obviously it didn't end up coming to fruition, a lot of people had the Warriors already penciled in as champions with, you know, that starting five that they had, and then they added DeMarcus Cousins. Uh, You know, so I think a lot of people thought that anything in terms of winning a championship would be after this year. And now it's clearly, uh, you know, a wide-open league, or at least more so than it's been in years with, you know, Golden State hobbled, uh, Kawhi's future up in the air in Toronto. And after the Sixers showing that they could, you know, took the Raptors the seven games, I think a lot of, People are confident that they probably could have beaten the Bucks in a series. The last time they played the Bucks in the regular season, they looked like a, a much better team. Um, you know, I think the Warriors obviously were, would have beaten the Sixers at, at full strength. But the Sixers are in a position now where they could, you know, take the, a step forward with the right moves this offseason and, and catapult into that discussion to be, you know, a team that could come out of the East. But they're also in a precarious spot that, you know, say they lose Jimmy and they're not able to really fill in with another top tier guy, they could end up, you know, taking a, a step step backwards but it's you know one of the more you know I think I feel like people say this every off season, but this really does seem to be one of the more important off seasons in terms of shaping the future of the franchise for the you know the short term moving forward I can't see Mike I'm, I've been trying to reconcile it in my head the idea of Jimmy Butler going to the Lakers I think they only have 21 million dollars in that or maybe 21 24, 20, I think 24 23 something like that as opposed to the money he would be able to make with the Sixers, but not only that, just just watching Jimmy Butler and how competitive he is, and, and he right now is the guy for the Sixers who has the ball in his hand in a close game, fourth quarter, when you might need more than just a Joel, you know, hook or something like that. And and if he goes to the Lakers, he's clearly behind LeBron, behind he maybe even Anthony Davis in that situation. I just don't see the Lakers being some great panacea for Jimmy Butler like maybe it's been speculated as as opposed to what the Sixers can offer him in both money and playing time and importance. Yeah, no, I, I actually totally agree with you. And I think the Anthony Davis acquisition by them made it even less likely that he goes there. A, you know, both financially, uh, you know, obviously, because they'll have his salary, less cap space to, you know, to offer Jimmy moving forward. But also role-wise, I thought, you know, maybe if, if Jimmy was going to go there and be the second guy with LeBron, kind of like a Pippen, 
in L.A. that kind of could have been something that would be intriguing to him. But like you said, LeBron's a guy that, especially down the stretch of games, does a lot of things similar to Jimmy in terms of having the ball in his hands, whether it's to create you know, offense for himself or his teammates. Obviously, LeBron's going to be the guy that has the ball in his hands down the stretch. And then after you get a guy like Anthony Davis, who has you know a, a top five talent, I think most agree in the league, obviously he's going to be your, your number two, sometimes your number one option, which leaves Jimmy a cut number three, where in Philly he's in a situation where you know, like you said, Jeff, A, they can pay him more than any other team, and B, he carved out a role for himself that's really nice where he's not necessarily looked at to have to score, you know, 30 a game, but when it comes down to the, the clutch time, fourth quarter, and the Sixers need baskets, he has the ball in his hand, and that just wouldn't be the case in L.A. So unless he was really, you know, just hung up and, and dedicated to the idea of physically living and playing in Los Angeles, it doesn't seem that the Lakers have anything, um, you know, better to offer to him than the Sixers do. Another thing, and this is totally unrelated, but we got the draft on Thursday, and every time draft time has come up in the last year or two, I keep thinking of this guy wondering, whatever happened to him? The Sixers took a guy a couple of years ago, European stash, Euro stash, Ante Pachetsnik, right? What, he was like a seven foot center who could shoot, stretch type. He actually brought up a lot recently really? because he was playing in the uh, whatever games Some we're league? just on, and apparently, Michael, maybe you have more info on this. Apparently, he's pretty good. He does, uh, you know, he has game. I don't, I haven't like checked since the season ended. I don't know what his where he is status, but he is a, you know, he projects to be a dude that can space the floor out, rebound a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't know his status honestly in terms of if he's coming or ever coming over. But uh, yeah, I mean, he he has some game. Yeah, he's not one of the guys that was in the Sacramento deal, right? That they no, just he was fu- definitely threw, not no. in the Sacramento. No, I know. Deal. Yeah. I actually. He was playing in the World Games or something. He was like uh, Porzingis, his best friend, too. I think he's Yeah, the, no, I know exactly Canadian. who you're yeah. talking about. If I, I'll find his name and, and throw it out there, but I just was reading about this guy about a month ago, uh-huh. and somebody might have tweeted it to me about, hey, what Euro about John? this guy coming over and, and playing with the Sixers because he apparently is – very successful in whatever it's like the whole thing you know yeah. you see the draft you see the guy taken and all they do on espn or wherever it is is show you the highlights and you become enamored it's like wow he looks just like poor thing same threes. type of game you know <laughs> and it's like hey where, where is he speaking you know? of the draft michael and we'll talk more draft uh on thursday's show but uh speaking of the draft any uh a guy came up to me yesterday and said you know all right what are they doing with 24 and i threw out my pick for him and and you know he, he was like really I've seen um, a lot of different mock drafts and take them for what they're worth, but it seems that everybody thinks Cam Johnson would be the guy if he was there. Number one, if he's there, I said I'd be shocked if they didn't take him if he was available. But what is your take uh, with the Sixers at 24? Yeah, Mike, that's definitely the the most popular name you're here. And I feel like every year there's, you know, one or two names ahead of the draft, you know, projected to where the Sixers are going to pick that you get here tossed around a lot. I'm also kind of the camp. I don't think that Cam Johnson is going to last until 24. It's weird because I saw him in mock drafts going in the second round yesterday, and I was shocked at that. Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't see it. He's a guy, I think, that, you know, obviously playing for a big school in North Carolina, he has a skill set that projects well to the NBA. It has a good frame. He's, you know, I think he's on 6'8", 200. I mean, he's just a guy that projects well to the NBA. So if he's there at 24, uh, you know, the Sixers worked him out. Uh, met a private workout with him, I think, over the weekend uh, recently. So they've, they're definitely interested in him. I think if he was there, he'd be he'd be the pick. It's, you know, a matter of it, if he is there. Um, obviously, there's a few other guys that they would have their, you know, eye on in that position. Well, a guy that I like a lot is uh, – I think uh, Bobo, obviously the son of, of Manute Boy, could uh, you know potentially come in and be a backup center for JoJo. Oregon, uh, right? He was on Oregon. He, yeah, he, he got yeah, hurt, hurt. and didn't play, right? Yeah, well, that that's another reason he would fit in perfectly. <laughs> <with the Sixers laughs> <in the> <laughs> you said it. <laughs> but uh, you know, so I think if they could get some value, that. Uh, obviously at that pick, at the point, it's going to become you know as their salary cap gets increasingly tied up in some of these max deals for Ben and coming up, and obviously Joel and whatever free agents they add, it's uh, you know increasingly important that they get value and and get guys that can contribute in these you know in the drafts, even if they're not picking in the lottery. So regardless of who they get, I think it's important that they you know hit on this pick. 
Uh, Michael Kasky Blomain. Follow him on Twitter at the Real Mike KB. And of course, the NBA draft Thursday night right here on 97.3 ESPN. MKB, appreciate it, pal. Thanks, guys, for talking to you.